This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Tonight we're going to talk about the other part of the cardiovascular system and that is the corazón, the heart. The heart of the matter is tonight, no pun intended. So we're going to talk about how it's reflection in terms of the four variables that we talked about last week and I'm going to introduce a variety of different diseases and how it alters the function of the heart. What we did last week was laying the foundation for what we're going to talk about the heart and we're going to go a little bit further and add some more foundational information so you can understand these various conditions that we're going to talk about tonight. And I brought some examples of these that we're going to be talking about tonight. So if you want to come down afterwards, and I'll show a couple of them during the presentation, so you can actually touch what it feels like. Touching is, is believing. You, today, when you're on the internet, you don't know what you're actually seeing is real and what has been photoshopped or some other alteration that's taken place. So let's talk about the pathology of the malfunctioning corazón. So the objectives, we're going to define, describe hypertension. This is a very serious problem in the human population. It's a common health crisis. It's a silent one. That's why most people don't realize it until they get diagnosed. And what does it do? Why is it so deadly? How do we define it? We did it last time. We're going to see what happens when your blood pressure goes up. It normally goes up when you get excited about taking finals, for exam. For example, or you're worried about what grade you're going to get, your blood pressure goes up if you were to measure it. Or if you go on your first date, your blood pressure goes up, your first dance, whatever it may be. But it'll be something. Or applying to college, your blood pressure will go up, but only temporarily. The other thing we're going to talk about is a, the most common cause of death in the United States involves the corazón. And this is the lack of perfusion. We call this ischemic heart disease. And we'll define what this term means, because it's an umbrella term that encompasses four other conditions. And we'll look at one of these, what we call a heart attack or myocardial infarct. And what does that involve? The third thing, we're describe the pathogenesis of myocardial infarct and its complications as part of that. We're also going to describe about the immunologic system and how our immune system can injure our heart. And this is an example called acute rheumatic heart disease where we are infected with a bacterium, we'll go through this, and how our immune system attacks that, but then because it's been attacking that microbe, it'll also attack our cardiovascular system and cause damage to it. And then we're going to talk about this entity. What does it mean by having congestive heart failure? Any of the things that we've talked about above in these objectives can lead to congestive heart failure. And so we'll define it, and then how do you recognize it? Seeing a patient, you can make the, anybody in this room, once you realize what you're looking for and based on what we've talked about in this series, you'll be able to recognize it fairly quickly, within seconds, and I'll demonstrate that at the end. And so that is our journey for the night as, my, as being your storyteller. So the first thing, go back, we're always interested in what? In pathology, the cause, the etiology. This becomes important because then we can prevent various diseases. We're going to talk about the story the pathogenesis in these various conditions that involve the heart. We're going to talk about the morphologic changes as a consequence. But remember, what always precedes morphologic changes are biochemical changes. And this is where you get to use your biology in high school and chemistry and apply it in what we built upon last time. 
Then we're going to talk about the clinical consequences. What happens if, this ha if you have changes to the cortisone or the heart? And what, are they, what will you anticipate? Because this principle applies to all organ systems that are altered in various conditions. So that is our, we remind ourselves, the overview of pathology. The other thing we have to remember is this that we showed last time is the diagram that every cell in the, tissue, in the body, including the myocardial cells, as well as other components of the heart, they're basically in a homeostatic state. As we're sitting right now, they're const it's pumping blood through your cardiovascular system. It's being regulated by the autonomic nervous system. There are important hormones that are re regulating this whole process, and you don't even have to think about it, even during your exams. It's done automatically, and it's taken many years to evolve to this point. And so, obviously, any organ system or the within the body, in this case in humans, it's under stress or demand, it's got two choices. And what are the two choices from last time? Adapt or die. die. And that is the moral of the story. And that's what we're gonna see what happens when we go through these various conditions that what is the heart gonna do when it sees hypertension or when it sees the lack of oxygen or if the immune system injures the myocardium or other parts of the heart, what is it gonna do? and what are the consequences when these things are altered. So we talked about the thing when cells die in tissue, we call that necrosis. Remember the definition? A condition of dead tissue surrounded by living tissue. So we're gonna see this in the consequences and the time frame or pathogenesis. In apoptosis is individual cells in response that go through programmed cell death. So what are the four critical variables that we talked about when we talk about the cardiovascular system, whether it's blood vessels or the heart? One is what? This is the last time. Pressure. Pressure is critical because without pressure you cannot perfuse tissue. What's also important about the cardiovascular system is the variable volume. Within the chambers of the heart, well, as well as remember, the greatest volume of blood is found in what? The arterial side or the venous side? Venus, see, Igor would be very impressed, okay? And so volume is a critical variable. Then there are the two C variables. You have always to think about one is, this is a very active organ system. So contractility is critical to propel blood, whether it's from the chambers of the heart, to the heart or through the cardiovascular system. And the last but not least, the other C word is the compliance. The vascular walls, or in this case, we're going to talk about the walls of the heart and how it plays a critical role and how it's going to affect the ability of the heart to uh, work. So we'll see this over and over again. So let's talk about hypertension. People will give you numbers, but the, really the definition to define hypertension is basically an elevated blood pressure that leads to end organ damage. Most people will understand that versus this definition that medical students and other health allied professionals will regurgitate you to you, is that a systolic pressure, which is going to be 140 greater, or a diastolic pressure greater than 90. Most people you tell that, they won't remember it once you ask them, what did the doctor tell you? Oh, they say, I got blood pressure, I got to take these water pills and out the door. But that's about it. But it's more important because it's very common. It is a silent process. You do not feel pressure. You'll feel the consequences of the pressure on the end organs. How common is it in the United States? In a population that's roughly over 300 million people, roughly 50 to 60 million people will develop hypertension during their lifetime. That means one out of five or six. I'd say that's very common. And it's critical to know what you need to do to control it and to prevent it. When you're young, exercise throughout your life or exercise to get to this age is very important because it helps keep that cardiovascular system well-tuned, okay? The complications are devastating, as you, I'll show you in just a moment. And basically, it's when you have the problems of hypertension is that you're further down in the story. It's often too late and what the consequences. So it's important to control it, recognize it as soon as possible, and deal with it. Remember, you're taking biological material, the heart and the blood vessels, and exposing it to physical trauma. It's like taking my hand and doing this. 
What's going to happen to my hand if I get hard enough on that? I'm going to either break the skin or break the bones. And it's essentially when that heart is beating against that pressure or the pressure against the wall, that's exactly what's happening six to 80 times per minute or greater. Something's going to give to that biological material. It's just a matter of time. And no organ is spared in the body. And this is also something critical you have to remember. It's not just your cardiovascular system, but it's your other organ systems that are going to be affected as well, as you will see. So formulas. High school students always like formulas. This is the formula for blood pressure. And this becomes very important as a healthcare provider in understanding, as well as the patient, is that the blood pressure is dependent upon the cardiac output. How much the cardiac output is defined as the stroke volume of the heart, it's pumping out, times the heart rate. Then the, it's times the total peripheral resistance in your vessels, your arteries, in response to this. And you can see the various factors in terms of blood volume, what's the ion, wherever it travels, water will travel with it. Sodium. sodium. So if you have too much sodium bottom, the volume goes up in your cardiovascular system, therefore you can lead to hypertension. That's why they often tell you to restrict the amount of sodium in your diet, so it prevents exacerbating or creating hypertension. There are mineral corticoids, these are hormones that's found in the adrenal gland, and essentially what it does is it retains sodium and gets rid of potassium and hydrogen. And atrial peptin is important for ions like sodium and potassium and can affect the blood volume. Those in the peripheral vascular space, if you constrict blood vessels, what happens to resistance? It increases, so pressure goes up as a consequence. So there's various molecules that are being released in the body from catecholamines from your adrenal glands, angiotensin being released by the kidneys, and thromboxane, a prostaglandin, leukotrienes, and endothelium, which is a vasoconstrictor made by endothelial cells. Then you have vasodilators, you have other local factors, pH, hypoxia, and your autonomic nervous system controlling your vessels as well as your heart. And so heart rate, contractility, all these factors are critical to maintain your perfusion or blood pressure to your various organs. Remember this diagram I showed you last time. You always have to have a picture of the cardiovascular system and thinking about the conduits. So when hypertension, which side of the cardiovascular system is hypertension going to wreak its worst effect on? on the arterial side or the venous side? That's right. Because it's this physical kinetic energy that's being released that's going to cause damage on the elastic arteries like the aorta, the muscular arteries, as well as the arterials. And if it's severe enough, it can also cause damage to the capillaries as a consequence of the pressure. So it's the arterial side. And we're going to talk about later tonight the post capillary venule that we talked about in terms of cells getting out of the intravascular space and you'll see how it becomes important when you have tissue injury in the case of a myocardial infarct. And I do have a movie for you tonight. Seeing is believing. <laughs> this is a consequence we talked about last time. What's the major risk factor for atherosclerosis of the aorta? Hypertension. This took right many, four to five decades to develop. Do you feel this? No. This is silent. Is it preventable? Yes. Now, with hypertension, what is this going to do to the heart? The heart is seeing resistance, or what we call the afterload. It has to pump against to get it out of the aortic valve, as you know from your anatomy, from Dr. Smoot. So what happens when you go to the gym? How many people go to the gym? No matter what age, right? Why do you go to the gym? You atrophy your fat cells, make them smaller, and you make those muscle cells buffed out, so you're more attractive, as you think, either physically or mentally, depending on how you look in the mirror. Because you notice in gyms, they always have mirrors, so they can see every facet of your muscles, so you can feel good about yourself. So what is that working on those weights is like working the heart on the weights. So now what is the myocardial cells going to do? There are various hormones that 
alpha adrenergic that stimulates the catecholamines, angiotensin II, endothelium growth factors, but it's the, mu the mechanical stretch of muscle. That's why you go to the gym, when I'm doing this in the gym and I have resistance to it, it's going to tell the muscle cells to make contractility proteins. And there are a variety of genes that are critical, that are listed here, that will cause the synthesis of the contractility proteins called actin and myosin. That's what gives the bulk of the muscle and contractility. But it's a constant stretch. That's why if you don't go to the gym, what happens to the muscle? It goes back to where it originally was, before you went to the gym. That's why, you, that's why they offer, often, often offer you a lifetime membership because they know they got you hooked. Okay? So it's this increase force on the heart, the afterload, that will stimulate this process. So let's go through a little anatomy. Now the heart points in what direction in your body? To the left, to the center, or to the right? Which way do you think it points? Well, here's a heart, and it points like this. This is what your heart would look like in your chest. So even though you're walking straight, the heart is always pointing to the left, normally. That's why when they take you to a physician and you get a physical exam, often you have the doctor will bend, have you bend over like this and then put the stethoscope. And what is falling forward is the heart itself against your chest wall so they can hear the blood flow. That's why. This is the apex of the heart. This is the base of the heart. So the heart looks like it's sitting in your chest like this. This is your right ventricle. The normal thickness of your right ventricle is three millimeters thick is the greatest thickness. It's under low pressure because of the pressure within the pulmonary vasculature pumping in there. The left ventricle, the normal thickness of an adult heart, the ventricular wall is one centimeter thick. It has to be thicker than the right because it has a greater arterial pressure to pump against. So this is the normal heart. It has fat. We all have fat around our heart. It's normal. Fat is good. Too much is not good. But you normally have fat. It's one of the storage sites. The septum separates. You can see right here is the septum. It separates and you have how many valves? This is a good anatomy question. How many, how many chambers of heart do you have? Four. Four. So how many valves do you have? Four. Four. It's that simple. Now if you're a frog, how many chambers are there? Three. So how many valves? Three. Three. See how easy that is? Just have to count. Three, four. Okay? What's the normal thickness of a heart valve? One sheet of paper. Next time you turn a sheet of paper, you're turning the thickness of a heart valve. It's avascular. And you can come up and feel it. And it has to last you eight, nine, plus nine months of decades of life. And it's got to pump every time. You hear the heart sounds. Okay? So this is what a normal heart looks like. Okay? And if we take a cross section through the heart, you can see this is one centimeter, this is the left ventricle, and the right ventricle is on the left. You can see how thin that is, okay? Believe me, okay? Now, if you look at this, it's the same thing up here, and you'll notice we see the left and right chambers. So the way we're looking at this heart is that pathologists were very simple-minded people. I went over the thing. The left is the left and the right is the right. So we're cutting the heart perpendicular to the long axis. So when you look at this, there is the left ventricle and there is the right ventricle. And if I were to take your heart, I won't. But if I were, you cut it, this is what you would look like inside. You can see here's the chamber of the blood and here's the chamber. This is the posterior papillary muscle and the anterior papillary muscle because the mitral valve is a bicuspid valve, has two leaflets, versus the right ventricle, the valve that separates from the right atrium from the right ventricle is called the tricuspid valve. So there's three leaflets, and, but there's only two papillary muscles, anterior and posterior, and the septal leaflet, the attachment to the corda tendini is directly to the septum. Here's the septum that separates your right ventricular chamber from your left, and your atria would be above. So this is what a normal heart looks like. And you can see the normal amount of yellow fat. Okay? This is a normal myocardium. Here's a little histology. How do we, there's three types of muscle in the body. Skeletal muscle, smooth muscle you find in the uterus, in your GI tract, in your bronchi, the walls, as well as in blood vessel walls. The third muscle 
is going to be cardiac. And this is what normal heart muscle looks like. What makes it unique is, when you look at that arrow, it's the only muscle that branches. It's the only muscle that branches. All the other ones do not branch. The other characteristic is that it has a nucleus centrally located. Skeletal muscle through, embryolo through embryologic development is formed by the fusion of myoblasts, so it's multinucleated, and the nuclei on the outside of the contractility apparatus. The third feature is that pink line at that arrow is demonstrating the intercalated disks. These are gap junctions because this is a conduction system, so electrical impulses, depolarization, and repolarization has to take place, so you have to have intimate contact. The third component you can't, or the fourth component you can't see here is what we call cross striations, where you can actually see the bands, the actin and myosin overlapping. And since it's, high, it's, since it's a highly dependent aerobic organism requiring oxygen, what do you notice here? You see the capillaries in between the myocytes. So this is a very highly vascularized tissue. It has to through the coronary circulation when you look at this process. Now, this is what side of the heart looks abnormal here, the left or the right? Look at it carefully. What do you notice about the thickness of the left ventricular wall compared to the right? Look at it. This is what's left of the right. It's being squished. This is what happens when the heart sees hypertension. Now, if you look at this heart, you can see all the way back there how thickened that. This is somebody from hypertension. You can see the left ventricle, how thick wall it is. That's greater than one centimeter thick. So this heart becomes thicker. At first, you'd say, hey, that sounds pretty good. But what does a heart look like from an athlete? That's different, because the heart does get enlarged. And this is from a heart from an athlete. And you can see the difference. See the difference between the ventricles? Your heart will normally get larger and more efficient. Your heart rate goes down as an athlete because your ability, your stroke volume goes up, so you need less beats of the heart to pump the blood out. But there's a problem. If the heart becomes enlarged, what happens to the oxygen and nutrient demand on that myocardium? It increases. So what if people die in their sleep because they don't control their blood pressure? They die of a arrhythmia. The heart will produce an arrhythmia, means abnormal uh, contraction and basically stop because electrical impulses are such that the hypertrophied muscle cells, as I'll show you in a minute, act as ectopic pacemakers. And so you have uncontrolled and you can die in your sleep. Or because there's increased demand of oxygen and nutrient, you can't get enough blood to it so they can have a heart attack at any moment. And the person doesn't feel this, by the way. So when you look at the myocardial cells, the nuclei become bigger because their transcriptional activity making the genes for actin and myosin. And you'll notice that the width of the myocyte is bigger because there's more contractility proteins being synthesized in response to the pushing that the heart has to push to get the blood out of the ventricular chamber. And here's another myocardial cell. The nucleus is enlarged as well as the myocyte in response to this stretching or adaptation. So the adaptation can lead to complications, in this case, the myocardium. Here's another complication. What's the leading cause of intracerebral hemorrhage where your blood vessel blows out in your brain? Is hypertension. And this is a patient who had a hemorrhagic stroke as an ex another organ system. So all organs are affected. Your kidneys are going to be destroyed as a function of time as well. And I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. So what are the causes? Well, unfortunately, the vast majority, this is what we use all these different names when you don't know something in medicine. It's called either essential, idiopathic, means unknown, or we call it primary. And basically, that represents about 90, 95% of all elevated blood pressure, the, the cause is unknown. They would define it as benign, where somebody has a blood pressure or systolic of 140, 150, or 160 over 90, 100. And that's for the majority of what people have. And there's one that's called accelerated or malignant. This is a medical emergency when your systolic pressure goes over 180. I've seen patients who had blood pressures, a systolic pressure 
where you couldn't measure it on the blood pressure cuff where it was over 300. And they come to the emergency room because they're complaining of a headache that won't go away. And so this will occur. There are people walking out with blood pressures in the 200s or greater, and they don't know it until they have a major accident. So you can imagine how hard, that, how hard the heart is working against a blood pressure, trying to pump blood out if the pressure is that high in the aorta and the blood vessels. What's an organ system if you destroy it? This is the other 5 or 10% that leads to hypertension. What organ do you think is important for controlling your blood pressure? If you destroy it in any disease, I'm going to give you a list of diseases, is the kidneys. Because what controls volume and sodium? Kidneys. Uh, so if you destroy it, you can't get rid of the water, you can't control it or the sodium. So renal causes. They, these are where you have acute damage to the glomeruli that are important for filtering your blood. And so you can't filter it now, so you can get hypertension. This is a what is called pyelonephritis, pylo meaning renal pelvis. This is inflammation. This is typically seen in females because females have a shorter urethra compared to males, and so they have increased propensity for getting bladder infections. That's why it's not good to hold your urine, no matter what sex you are, because you can cause reflux of the urine back up to your ureters, back into your kidneys, and the infection goes upstream and therefore goes an infection in your kidney and in the renal pelvis. And chronic, when you hear the word chronic in any disease, it means scarring or fibrosis. So now the kidneys become scarred and now become non-functional and we've got a problem. Like hypertension. There are genetic diseases that alter the normal formation of what we call the nephron, which is the important functional unit, morphologic and functional unit, and it's destroyed in these genetic diseases that are also uh, recessive and dominant. If you cut off blood supply to the kidney, since the kidney will respond to decrease blood pressure, it will secrete renin and other molecules that will stimulate the production of vasoconstriction as well as mineral corticoids and you get more sodium and you can lead to hypertension. And this is a condition you may come across where it's abnormal deposition of extracellular protein. Since proteins circulate in the body, if they accumulate in various conditions, it can destroy the kidney and lead to hypertension. And then urinary tract obstruction, like a male, for example, has enlargement of the prostate, they obstruct the urethra, the urine can't get out, backs up in the bladder, it expands, it goes up the ureters, and then goes up into the kidneys. And because of that hydrostatic pressure, the urine building up in the kidneys, you can lead to what is called hydronephrosis. What does hydro mean? Water. There's a backup of water in this case into the kidneys and chronically will destroy it and that can lead to hypertension. Another cause, what's another organ system that controls your blood pressure that we mentioned in that formula is the endocrine system. Endocrine organs are those organs that secrete hormones that have target tissues. For example, there's a, a this is a tumor that arises from the medulla of the adrenal glands and the medulla releases catecholamines that causes the vasoconstriction of the blood vessels and increase the heart rate it's, if you, what does chromo mean? Color. color. What does pheo mean? So you get to learn vocabulary. Remember MD, medical dictionary. <laughs> pheo means dark colored. This is a dark colored tumor when you look at it grossly. Because it's catecholamines versus the, cor the cort cortex of the adrenal gland is yellow because it takes cholesterol and makes the hormones like glucocorticoid, mineral corticoid, as well as your sex hormones are also made in the adrenal gland. This is a aldosteronism. Aldosterone is a mineral corticoid that made by the adrenal gland. You get tumors that secrete this, that retain sodium from the kidney and volume goes with it in terms of water. And then Cushing syndrome, mineral corticoid effect, where you retain sodium and water. And then there are steroids that people can get hypertension from drugs and estrogen, other hormones that can take, can also lead to hypertension. And if you had a benign tumor of your pituitary, which is the base of your brain, in the middle of your skull, that it secretes hormones that can stimulate the adrenal gland to release catecholamines as well, or other uh, hormones in the cortex of the adrenal gland. What's another organ system is the cardiovascular. And this is, coarctation means narrowing, and this is typically acquired, where basically you're born with a narrowing of the arch of the aorta, so the, after the 
left subclavian artery. Because after that, remember the left subclavian artery gives rise to blood to your left arm, your right subclavian artery to your right arm, as well as your carotids going up in your head, neck, and then the vertebral arteries. So when you get the narrowing of the aorta past those branches on the thoracic aorta, the pressure builds up and you get hypertension only in the arms. So what do physicians do when they first evaluate you? Where do they take your blood pressure? Your arms? And they should also should look at your pressure in your legs because the pressures can vary. So if you're a person that has high blood pressure in the upper extremities but not in the lower extremities, that means there may be a problem in the aorta. So knowing the anatomy becomes important. Another is if you had a vascular damage, inflammation, there's a, a name of a vascular disease, vasculitis called inflammation of the vessels called polyuritis. Poly meaning what? Many. Many arteries. The one arteries that are spared are your pulmonary arteries. No one knows why. But if you cause damage to the arteries and they become scarred and fibrotic, what happens to compliance? Goes down. And what happens to resistance? And what happens to your blood pressure? See, you now have a good story. That's how easy it is. Ah, what happens to when, you, when a woman gets pregnant, what happens to her blood volume? It increases. It has to in response to feeding the blood oxygen and nutrients to the fetus as well with the placenta. And so what women can develop during pregnancy is hypertension. We call that preeclampsia. And then obviously high blood pressure when you're pregnant both to the mother and the fetus have can dire consequences. And last but not least is neurogenic. How many people worry in this room? What do you think happens to your blood pressure when you worry? So be happy when you're taking your finals. Just go in there mellow. What's the worst thing that can happen? Yeah, you gotta just take it again. If that's the worst thing that's gonna happen in your lifetime, you're the luckiest human being on this planet. Okay? Life will continue. But you'll worry still. You'll do fine. So let's talk about hypertension in terms well, benign. We increase the pressure, systolic pressure of 140 over 90 or 100. What's going to happen? We're going to use the kidney. Since the kidney gets 10 to 15% of the cardiac output, what's going to happen to tissue? So what's going to happen to the normal kidney, the normal kidney is about 12 to 14 centimeters in length behind your 11th and 12th rib. It's a little lower on your right side because what organ's right above it is the liver. That's what pushes it down. Since your stomach is not, or spleen on the left side is not going to be an issue. So what happens is the kidney bee either gets normal or gets smaller. And I've seen kidneys this big after people have had hypertension for decades. The kidney is about three or four centimeters in length now. Non-functional. And why does that occur? Well, what happens is you're getting chronic damage to the kidney and you're going to lead to scarring. What is the scar tissue? Because of cross-linking of proteins, the collagen, it'll contract down. So it shrinks and there's less functional tissue. So this is what it looks like. What vegetable does this remind you of? That looks like cauliflower? Oh, overdone cauliflower. What else does it remind you of? A spud, which is another name for potato. There's all these good vocabulary terms. You want to do Scrabble on the internet? Call me up. We'll have fun. That's not butter, by the way, what you're looking at here. This is a kidney that's, you notice there's a ruler. Remember I told you the normal length of the kidney is 12 to 14 centimeters. What do you notice about the length of this kidney? When you look at the ruler, it is smaller and the chronic damage. And so next time you go shopping and look at potatoes, you'll have a different appreciation to what it would look like in somebody with hypertension. Okay? Why does this occur? Well, let's go to the blood vessels. Because what is going to see this pressure that normally doesn't see the pressure that, uh, that high is your arterioles before you get to the capillaries. So what is happening? Think of my hand as a capillary. And Basically, the lining are endothelial cells, and the endothelial cells have a gap. So now if you increase the pressure, what are you going to do to the, the arterioles? You're going to cause them to dilate. By dilating, you now form a gap between those endothelial cells where plasma proteins now have an easier way of leaking out into the wall. 
They contain many molecules, will stimulate scarring or fibrosis. So now if the wall becomes thicker and thicker, what happens to the size of the lumen? Gets smaller. And what happens now to blood flow? Decrease. Now what happens to oxygenation and nutrients that tissue? It goes down and now what happens to the size of the organ? It gets smaller and smaller and becomes non-functional, in this case the kidney. What do you think happens to your skin? Same thing. What do you think happens to your GI tract? Same thing. How about to your blood vessels in your brain? One of the causes of dementia is vascular disease to the arterioles due to hypertension. Dementia means loss of higher cognitive skill. Can't think, can't take exams, finals or midterms, can't have judgment. So your cerebral cortex is affected. So what does this look like? This is in the kidney. If we look here, you can see here's a glomerulus. And then if you look, that's an arterial. You can see the wall is thickened. And you see the lumen is smaller. And here's another arterial where the wall is thickened and lumen. And this is occurring in all arterials through the body. And so you can see what's going to happen to organs and tissues. So is this person going to have a lot of energy? Uh-uh, because they can't perfuse the tissue. And so it becomes more of a sedentary life. So in malignant hypertension, let's elevate the blood pressure even higher. What's going to happen at this point? Well, depending upon how long you allow this to occur, it's going to cause blood vessels to burst, physically burst. And so you get what are called petechial hemorrhages. Petechiae means pinpoint hemorrhages. It could be in your eyes. Remember, you have arteries in your retina, and they can bleed out. They can also occur in the kidney, and it looks like a flea-bitten appearance. So it looks something like this. Here's a normal kidney in terms of size. But what do you notice? You see little red dots everywhere. Each one of those red dots represents an explosion of the arterial that's burst. So what is this patient going to complain about? Is blood or see blood in their urine, depending on how severe it is. Or it's detected by a dipstick when it goes in terms of chemically seeing that blood is in urine. Is it normal to have blood in your urine, by the way? Never. And so in this case, you have damage to the kidney because of the increased barrel trauma. So what happens microscopically? There are two lesions. What's going to happen is there's going to be causing the arterials, the smooth muscle cells will start to proliferate and the wall becomes thicker and thicker. The lumen becomes smaller, be less compliant. And so resistance goes up and it further exacerbates the lack of perfusion and oxygenation to the tissue. We call this hyperplastic arteriosclerosis. It's another, see, it's a good tongue tongue exercise. Now this is necrosis. What does necrosis mean? Now the tissue dies. This is a necrosis of the connective tissue that's under this trauma. And it looks like it's basically fibrinoid necrosis means fibrin, oid, like fibrin, which is a clotting uh, polymerization reaction we talked about last time. But in this case, it's collagen in the connective tissue that's going through necrosis and we get an inflammatory response to it. What does this look like? This is what the arterial looks like. What do you notice about the wall thickness? It's very thickened. What do you notice about the size of the lumen? Smaller. And then if you look at this arterial, you notice you see a lot of inflat little blue dots. Those are inflammatory cells. That's fibrinoid necrosis. It's actually dying, the wall, because of the physical trauma that's occurring. This occurs in your brain and other blood vessels throughout the arterials because they're taking the, a lot of the damage as, as, as well as the aorta. All right. Any questions about hypertension? Yes? What's the difference between malig uh, malignant and benign? Malignant means that the systolic pressure is greater than 180. If it's benign, the blood pressure is, later, uh, is less than 180. It's between 120 and to 140, 160. That's benign. That's what the majority of people have if you take their blood pressure. So when your blood pressure at rest is 180 or greater, you need to go to the emergency room because blood vessels are going to burst or they're going to cause damage to the other organs as a consequence. The next thing we're going to talk about is a heart attack. But before that, we have to talk, I've got to give you a little basic foundation information. The immune system. What's the function of the immune system? One, that's infections. What else? Huh? 
it'll remember, so it's, that's still infections, that's one. What's the other major reason you have an immune system? Get, get rid of what? Ah, that's the key. It gets rid of your dead cells. When you get necrosis or individual cells die, it's your immune system that comes in and gets rid of them. And this is what we use the immune system. Get rid of infections and dead tissue. That's the primary role of the immune system. So see, I'm getting you ready for the winter quarter if you decide. It's, all this stuff is interrelated. So there are the components of the immune system. There's the innate and adaptive. What does innate mean? It means right now you have your defense systems ready and poised to do battle with infections and dead tissue at a moment's notice. It's poised. So what are they? The obvious thing is there's a barrier between the outside world and the inside world. And we call that the epithelial barrier. What's the epithelium on our skin? The epidermis. In our oral cavity, we have a lot of bacteria that we swallow from food. We have colonized in the oral cavity and along the GI tract all the way down to the anus. So there's an epithelial barrier there. Then when you breathe in air, it can in your sinuses, your nasal passages, the back of your throat, going down into the trachea, into the lungs. So there's this epithelial barrier that protects us. Remember that infections can get in the bloodstream from other organ systems. So the kidney, what's the, uh, that has an epithelial barrier that protects it. In the nephron, in your ureters, in your bladder, going out the urethra. So anything that compromises that barrier, what can get across it that's illustrated there are microbes or infections. But there's something else you have to think of each organ system. Another way of defense is the constant flow of secretions. What organs constantly make secretions that constantly keep that flow moving so that you don't get an infection? Hmm? The lymph, because it's flowing out. Very good. What else? You have 14 organ systems to choose from. Hmm? Which? The heart is sealed off, unless it gets in the bloodstream, but it has endothelial cells. P is good. The constant flow of urine protects you from bacteria going upstream. If anything impedes urinary flow, it can go upstream. What age, what sex has this issue? Little girls between four to six. Why little girls and why four to six? Because at four to six, the world is very exciting. And they don't want to miss a beat. And that means going to the bathroom because if they do, it has already disappeared. They're going to miss out. So they hold their urine. My oldest daughter had this issue. And every night at dinner, did you pee today? That was the topic. <laughs> OK? What do boys do between four to six? Shh, oh, I felt good. I'll just keep playing. So everybody's got a different approach to this. So holding your pee, that's why lectures in medical school is 50 minutes, so you don't have to hold your pee, because people drink coffee and liquids and everything else. High school, the same thing. And college, too. OK? So pee is good. What's another is the GI tract. Constant flow of secretions, moving it. Anything that disrupts that, we have a problem. Our respiratory flat, uh, tract, we have phlegm, mucus. We have the mucociliary clearance in our sinuses. We have cilia that push it out all the time and get rid of it. Anything that interferes with it, we got a problem. There are two cells that are critical to this process. These are called neutrophils and monocytes or macrophages. Neutrophils live in our blood for about 10 hours when they're circulating, but when they are called in to get rid of dead tissue or an infection, they live about two days in our blood in their tissue. What comes after that are the monocytes that give rise to macrophages. These are mobile pharmacists of the body. And they have one unique characteristic that are important for infection of dead tissue. They love to eat. If I were to pick the perfect child, these are the cells I would choose. <laughs> they do not complain about what they're going to eat. They don't have no choice. And so it becomes important to realize that these cells, and this macrophage will eat this cell eventually. So it's a very cannibalistic society we live in at the cellular level. 
Then we have other things, complement. The liver is the fixed pharmacist in the body because it produces a lot of molecules like complement, part of the immune system that interacts with immunoglobulins, which are antibodies that are bound to microorganisms that we'll see tonight. And then you can see these are what are called natural killer cells. They're derived from lymphocytes. They're poison ready to do battle and they're ready to take care of it within hours or minutes, depending on, it's usually hours. Then we have what is called the adaptive immune system where we have B cells that will create antibodies which have this fork appearance that will bind to the surface of the microbes and who's going to eat it? How many people put sugar or, or brown sugar or syrup or fruit on your pancakes or cereal? Yeah, or in your salads? What you're doing is you're opsonizing it. You're making it nice and tasty. These are the opsins antibodies on the surface that these cells will eat the bacteria. So you sugarcoat the bacteria because you have receptors on these cells that will eat these microbes. Then there are the T cells that basically interact with antigens on the cells that are presented by the immune system like macrophages and now they'll react and cause the cells that are infected with an organism like viruses to die through the process of apoptosis. So this is the process and it takes days or weeks to develop either antibodies or T cells to fight off infections. This is a peripheral blood smear. These are what neutrophils look like or PMNs. They're segmented. This represents about two thirds of your white blood cells right now. If you took out your blood, these are poised and ready to do battle. And I'll show you what they're going to do when we get to a myocardial infarct. The immature cell, if it's coming out of the bone marrow, is called a band. It's unsegmented. You can see these have segments one, two, three. The third most common cell that's found in your blood right now, represents about 20% to 25, are lymphocytes. They're primarily T cells because the B cells that make the antibody, that are, the antigen is presented to them, live in your lymph nodes, your tonsils, lymphoid tissue along your gut, and lymphoid tissue in your skin. The third most common cell is the monocyte that will become the macrophage that lives in your tissues like 60 to 120 days. And last but not least are eosinophils. This is where you get allergic reactions like hay fever. This is the cell that's drawn in and because there's a variety of molecules as part of this process. And then parasitic infections. And then we have a basal fill and then we have platelets and red blood cells. The platelets are these small fragments of the megakaryocytes we talked about last time in terms of hemostasis. All right, now, how many people have had a pustule or a little pus? This is somebody who was gardening and got pricked by a rose bush and got infected with soil. And it's inflamed, it's painful, it's red because you get vasodilation and you got pus, PMNs. And here is pneumonia or inflammation, acute pneumonia. We have acute inflammatory cells. You can see there's the vasodilation because you want to increase blood flow to the tissue and allow those white blood cells to get out and fight the infection. And here in the alveolar sac, you can see the acute inflammatory cells fighting off an infection. This is a diagram to illustrate the cast of characters. And we're, this is going to be important when we get to the heart when we talk about a myocardial infarct. What do we see here are the neutrophils, lymphocyte, monocyte, macrophage, various molecules made by the liver, clotting factors, and so forth, eosinophils and basophil. A critical cell is the endothelial cell, and then on the outside is our macrophage, fibroblasts for tissue repair, and mast cell that's important to affecting the blood vessels and recruiting eosinophils as well as causing vasodilation. And here are extracellular molecules that would be important in response to this process. So this is the play. This is the scene of what's going to about to take place. So if you have dead tissue and you've got these white blood cells like the neutrophil and macrophage, they're going on an intravascular highway, aren't they? So how do they get out? Are there stop signs? Do they have cellular breaks? The answer is yes. And where do they exit to fight off an infection or get rid of dead tissue? The first thing that promotes this process, there are various molecules that cause vasodilation. Here's a normal capillary arterial, capillary venule. The red is oxygenated blood, becomes deoxygenated, and then becomes a little blue in color. Not in real life, but just in this diagram. But when you have 
an inflammation. When you have inflammation, what do you notice about the tissue? It swells and it turns what color? Red. It's because of this increased blood flow. But what do you notice about the oxygen content? It's greater because you need oxygen to fight off the infection for those cells to come in and take care of it. And blood is going to slow down a little bit. But where do those white blood cells come out of? Well, this is a diagram to illustrate. Here's a neutrophil or a phagocytic cell. There are cellular molecules called adhesion molecules on your white blood cells and on your endothelial cells. These molecules interact and you'll actually, the first thing you'll see is that the cells roll over the endothelial cells, like putting on the brakes on your car, slowly slowing it down. Because it's in the dark, they can't see. There are molecules that are released by the cells in the tissue called chemokines are one example that it's like a chemical gradient. If somebody brought pizza back there or burritos or nice tasty pastries, you would smell it. That's chemotaxis because you know where to go and not up here to see the organs. So there are chemical gradients that cells know where to go to get there. Now this doesn't look very appealing, I mean in terms of when you look at this. So this is what it looks like on a microscope. You see a blood vessel and they leave the intravascular space in the post-capillary venules. Right after the capillaries is where these adhesion molecules on the leukocytes and on the endothelial cells become upregulated to make them sticky. So here you can see with the arrow the various cells sticking. But then again, this is not what it really looks like. So what does it look like really? Here's your movie. See, there's pathology cinema somewhere. This is in a hamster cheek. This, what do you notice about the blood flow? This is what it's like to be a blood cell. It's going pretty fast. You can see it. In the center, where's the greatest velocity? In the center. And look at the rolling on the surface of those endothelial cells. Just like that. They're creeping. And you don't feel this, by the way. Then they're creeping along. And then you notice they've stopped now. And now i got to squeeze myself through that post-capillary venial. Now watch this one. Oh, it feels so good to squeeze through it. Look at this. It'll just flatten out. Ah, I'm out of there. <laughs> and it does it automatically. And that's what it's like to be a white blood cell to get out of the intervascular highway. It leaves precisely at the post-capillary venules in your tissue in response to an infection or to dead tissue. So this is what I always tell students. When there's dead tissue, necrotic tissue, who's the first cell to arrive? Neutrophils. Then followed by the macrophages, because they're critical for tissue repair, as we're going to see in a myocardial infarct. So what do I make the metaphor with medical students? Because one of the things that medical students are always hungry. So I always say, who's the first to arrive when there's free food? Medical students. Who comes next? The faculty. <laughs> they're both phagocytic. They love to eat. So do your white blood cells. Haven't you noticed when you have free food at high school, who's the first to arrive? Students. They know where to go because you're both phagocytic. So let's go now to the heart and see how we take this information and see what happens. Okay? So ischemia, lack of perfusion in the heart is the leading cause of death in adults in the United States, but it's declining because people are doing what, do you think? Exercising, eating right, moderation, controlling your blood pressure, all these things. Eating less salty foods, things of that nature. Now let's go through a little anatomy because we have to talk about ischemia, we have to talk about the blood supply. How many coronary arteries supply your heart are two. They come off at the root of the aorta behind the cusp of the aortic valve. And they have a unique distribution. You can see this is the anterior surface of the heart. Here's the posterior. It's flat because it sits on the diaphragm. So the left coronary artery supplies the anterior septum, which is the branch called the anterior descending. And then you have the circumflex. Circumflex means what? To go around. Exactly. Going around. And it supplies the left ventricular wall, while the right coronary artery takes care of most of the right ventricular wall and the posterior septum. Okay. So now if we take that, a human heart and we divide it up, 
This is how we look at the anterior septum. It's the left anterior descending. The circumflex takes care of the free wall on the left free wall not attached to the septum. Then the right takes care of the right wall as well as the posterior septum. Now, the blood vessels are in the epicardium. So the blood vessels have to send out branches. These are called mural branches. What does mural mean? Wall. wall. So these are mural branches that as they go across the surface of the heart will go into the myocardium. So when we look at the distribution of the blood vessels in the wall of the heart, we have to look at this diagram. So here we're looking, the heart has three layers. The epicardium that has blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatics. And then you can see that it gives off these epicardial above the myocardium, and then the endocardium, a very thin layer. And it arborizes like that arborization, like the root system of a plant. So where do you think is the last place to get oxygen is the subendocardium. This is where a heart attack begins in the wall because the last place to get oxygen is the first to die when there's a lack of oxygen. So if you have an occlusion, atherosclerotic disease, it's going to be this last part that's going to be vulnerable. And this is where one of the three places where you, the heart muscle can die as well as cause angiopectoris and other clinical manifestation, what we call ischemic heart disease, which I'll describe in a moment, which is now. When you hear the term ischemic heart disease, it really comes in four flavors or conditions. There are people who have what's called angiopectoris. Angiopectoris means chest pain. What it means is the heart muscle is not dying. That's called a heart attack. But it means that there is a lack of perfusion when the heart is typically of increased cardiac demand. In other words, you exercise. You increase cardiac needs of the body. And so what happens is it doesn't get enough perfusion, and so you can have chest pain as a consequence. Often people will be doing something like exercising or uh, getting into a fight with somebody because what happens to your blood pressure? Goes up. So it's going to cause the heart to work harder and strain it, and it doesn't get enough blood, it can cause chest pain. And the chest pain could be what is called stable, means you have to have some cardiac demand that causes chest pain while you're doing some activity. Or unstable angina is you're sitting in your chair right now and you're having chest pain at this very moment. That means you're just about to have a heart attack. You need to go to the hospital now. Okay. What we're going to talk about is what happens when the heart muscle dies. We call it myocardial infarction, the process of. Then you come to a condition called chronic ischemic heart disease. So chronic meaning many months or years. And what happens is, this is a patients that don't have chest pain. These are people that do not have a history of a heart attack. But they come in where the heart muscle each day, or every other day, each, um, because there's decreased perfusion to the heart, that the muscle cells degenerate and replace with scar tissue. So now if the heart gets more and more scar tissue, what happens to ability to contract out blood? decreases, now you can go into congestive heart failure, which we'll describe. So the pump is failing. Then we come across this is sudden cardiac death. And this is the fine is that you die of cardiac cause within one hour of symptoms. What's the most common cause is atherosclerosis of your coronary arteries. They're so plugged up or occluded that there's not enough blood supply, so you just walk to the bathroom and you basically collapse because you had either a heart attack or an arrhythmia and you, you're dead within one hour. What's an illicit drug that can do this is cocaine. This is one of the causes of sudden cardiac death is cocaine, because what cocaine does, it prevents norepinephrine uptake in the synaptic clefts of the nervous system, including the heart, and the heart basically leads to an arrhythmia and you can die. Okay? That's another cause. So we're going to talk about ischemic heart disease. You also hear the term, what is called acute coronary syndromes. So these are the four. It's another term that people use. So if we take your coronary arteries and we basically look at a normal, there's the intima, media, and adventitia, and we now get atherosclerosis over years, decades. Then it occludes it by about 50%. Now you can have typical angina. In other words, you're exercising and all of a sudden you start having pain 
on exercise. When you exercise, do you normally get chest pain? No, that's good. It's the first thing, okay? It's not normal. Because you have a lack of perfusion to the myocardium. Now, what would happen is if platelets start to bind to it, or if it becomes thickened, you notice the lumen is even less, maybe 80% occluded. Now the patient can develop now chronic ischemic heart disease, where the heart becomes scarred down, and now you lead to congestive heart failure. Or what would like to form an atherosclerotic plaque we talked about last time, a thrombus. And then that thrombus can occur within minutes or a few hours. And now it completely occludes it, so it can lead to unstable angina. Or you have an acute infarct, we'll describe subunit cardio in a moment. And then, or sudden cardiac death, where you get no blood flow to your myocardium. So here is basically the spectrum, and it's based on atherosclerosis. So there are corresponding histology. This is from a patient who had this type of coronary artery. You can see that the lumen is fairly narrow because of the atherosclerotic plaque. And here's what one looks like of sudden cardiac death. So what, do they, what is a common drug that they give to patients on a daily basis to prevent that thrombus from occurring when you have coronary artery disease? Is aspirin. A baby aspirin a day keeps the thrombus away because it acetylates the platelets and prevents thrombus formation so they don't have an acute heart attack. What is a regular aspirin is about 325 milligrams. A baby aspirin is about 80 milligrams. That's why they call it baby, because of its size. Aspirin is a great drug, by the way. You know where it comes from, what plant? The willow bark. 49ers, miners, would Miners would get headaches. They didn't have a drugstore, CVS, or anything like that, or the internet, so they go suck on the willow bark. So did the Indians get headaches. They had headaches too during those days. Okay. This is what a coronary artery looks like, the circumflex. And here's a nice atherosclerotic plaque. It's yellow because of the lipid. And you can see what's left of the lumen is in this right here. Okay. All right. So. When do you start seeing these ischemic heart disease? When 75% of your lumen is occluded. So you can see why it's silent until it gets to a threshold where you don't get enough perfusion to that heart. The atherosclerotic effect uh, will affect the epicardial branches, the atherosclerotic plaques, not the branches within the wall. The most common artery to be involved in your coronary circulation because it's a branch is off the left is the LAD, the left anterior descending, then the circumflex, and then the right. But some people can have all your coronary arteries all at once. And then now we come to this topic about infarcts, when the heart muscle dies. When 50% of myocardial infarcts occur, 50% or 50% or of all myocardial infarcts will have a thrombus associated with a atherosclerotic plaque, where part of the wall dies. Or if it's the complete wall, we call this transmural, 90% will have a thrombus. Because one of the drugs they give to people at a time of a heart attack is tissue plasminogen activator, which causes lysis of that thrombus. So it allows perfusion in the first six hours. And I'll show you why it's six hours and not beyond. So what are the signs and symptoms? How do you make the diagnosis of a heart attack? And this is important because it's a clinical path correlation of what's going on with the patient. First is chest pain. What will they describe the chest pain is substernum, because that's where the heart is pointing. They're going to feel the pain right here. And it can radiate up to the, into the neck or down the left arm because of re, what's called referred pain. There are four groups of people that can have a heart attack and have no chest pain. What, do you, what sex tolerates pain better, men or women? Women. All in the movies is fake. It's the women that tolerate the pain. The original studies of studying myocardial infarcts were done in men, not women. Women can have a heart attack without having chest pain. So that's critical. Another group of patients are diabetics because they get sensory neuropathy, so they have no pain sensation because of the diabetes. Another group of people are the elderly. What's elderly? Because that's a very touchy service. Everybody looks at this. As you get more gray hair, everybody has a different point of view of what elderly is. Talk about 80, 90, 100, okay? 
There, everybody feels good about that number, right? You see, no one's, no one's arguing with that. Um, why? Because in any disease process, your immune system and how you deal with uh, various illnesses can be atypical. So people can be very stoic and say, well, I don't have pain, but they're having pain. They refuse to admit it. Another group of people are people that have heart transplants. Because when you have a heart transplant, you denervate the heart because you're putting in another heart, you don't reconnect it, it's the electrical impulses, so they can have no chest pain and have a heart attack as well. Okay, that's important. The next thing is, because cells are dying, what is gonna go up in your bloodstream to fight off the dead tissue are leukocytes or white blood cells. You're gonna have an EKG because it's electrical properties that are gonna be changed because of the damage, your heart muscle's dead, so it can interfere with the conduction, and it can be picked up on EKG, and because cells die, molecules are gonna be measured. You think of a cell like a sack of molecules, so if the cell dies, what happens to that sack? It releases unique molecules. What has been used today is this molecule called troponin I, it's part of the contractility apparatus, and it's specific to the heart, and it starts to go up at about six to eight hours after your heart muscle dies. So that's why they'll take the blood from a patient who's coming in with a heart attack to see if it's going up. If it hasn't gone up yet, it means the heart attack is less than six hours. Because some people say they had chest pain five hours ago, but they, they may think it's right now. So it just depends upon, you can tell what's going on. So it's six to eight hours, and so all of these findings is what you use to make the diagnosis of a myocardial infarct. What are the complications? The most common is arrhythmia because you've now damaged the conduction system so the heart can't function properly. It can, if you, 40 to 50% of your heart muscle dies, the heart stops completely and you go to cardiogenic shock because it cannot pump because it's dead heart muscle. Or it fails at a pump and therefore blood backs up in the lungs or in the venous system on the systemic side. So here, if we go through this process, we, this is a diagram to show biochemically what's gonna happen. You have decreased blood flow in the coronary artery. What organelle is gonna be affected that's depicted here? The mitochondria, because that's critical for making ATP, which is critical as an energy currency for the contractility. So what happens is you get less uh, oxidative phosphorylation, so the ATP goes down, so what do you use instead? Sugar but that's not a very effective way of generating ATP. So what happens is ATP is important for keeping ions inside and outside your cell. So sodium is high on the outside, while potassium is high on the inside, and calcium is higher on the outside. So what happens is you have less ATP or going to the pump, so if, if sodium comes into the cell, what, ha what falls sodium? So what happens to the size of the cells? They get bigger. And what else comes in is calcium. And calcium is evil to cells. Because when the calcium comes into the cell, it'll set off various enzymes to digest yourself. That cell will start to break down. There are enzymes called endonucleases that'll chop up your DNA in your nucleus. That's not good. It'll set off phospholipases that break down the plasma membrane of the cell as well as the organelles, like the mitochondria. And you also will allow ATPase activity to consume ATP and lower this that's gonna cause damage to the cells. You go, you're gonna make lac lactic acid so the pH goes down in the cell. You consume the glycogen. And then protein synthesis is gonna be disrupted. And then there's gonna be a point of ir irreversible injury or cell death, and now you release those enzymes, and that tells you you're having a heart attack. So that's what clinicians use to see if when cells die, like your liver cells, they measure the liver function, looking at those enzymes. Or if you have your pancreas, like amylase and lipase that are released when the pancreas is damaged. So there are various things to look at cell injury clinically. So this is a complex chart, but I'm gonna go through it in steps to show how this process occurs in time. So the first thing you see is biochemical process. You're going from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism. What's the time frame? 20 minutes from the time that heart muscle is deprived of oxygen. So you biochemical changes. Is it still reversible? 
Yes, because if you go to this table here, you can see that there's the 20 minutes, and then after that, it's now the muscle cells are dying in response to this. So then you notice by about six hours, the muscle is completely dead that was affected by that decreased perfusion. That's why it's important to know this because if you wanted to salvage that heart muscle because of a thrombus that occurred in that atherosclerotic plaque, you give them a drug like TPA, the or clot busting drug that allows perfusion into that heart to re, to you lose less heart muscle because of this. Okay? And what's the time frame from zero hours to six weeks is the lifespan of a heart attack. It takes the time to have reversible injury at 20 minutes, then it dies, and then what is the immune system going to do? It's got to get rid of it. And now you have to repair the heart while it's working. And it takes up to six weeks to become scar tissue. And that's what I'm going to show you now is the story of what happens from zero hours to six, hours, six weeks. Okay? So it's easy to remember. What this table is showing you is the gross changes and the microscopic. Because you can see, microscopically, you get, what, you get necrosis. We call this coagulative necrosis and I'll explain that in a minute. Then you get neutrophils, macrophages, and then scar tissue at six weeks. And then the gross, the heart muscle becomes pallor, lighter in color, and then it becomes softer because it's necrotic, it's gonna be more compliant. And then basically the enzymes that are from the phagocytic cells, the PMNs, are gonna further degrade the muscle, make it weaker, and then eventually you replace it with scar tissue. And that takes weeks from the time of the heart muscle. So let's go through this. So microscopically, what do you notice about these cells? These are myocardial cells. There's no nuclei. It tells you it's dead because of the endonucleases. And the, this is within six hours of a heart attack. How can I tell you that six hours and not beyond? Because I don't see inflammatory cells. Remember, it took time to get from the intervascular space, like in that movie. So that's why I know this is less than six hours. But what do you notice about the fibers? They're doing what? Very descriptive. When I see an ocean, it reminds me of the waves coming in in the first six hours of a myocardial infarct. <laughs> There's all these things out there. So here are muscle cells. What tell them, tells you these muscle cells are dead? There's no nuclei. This is coagulative necrosis, but we don't see an inflammatory response. And what happens is where those black arrows are showing you where the contractility proteins are clumping on themselves. This is what is called contraction band necrosis. But it's still within six hours. Then, as a function of time, here's the dead muscle, there's new nuclei, and now we see what? A lot of inflammatory cells, those neutrophils that I showed you, because it took time to get from the intravascular space to the extravascular space, and it's maximal at three to five days. And they contain enzymes that are gonna try to break this down, and phagocytize it, but they only live one or two days. Then as a function of time in this table, you'll see there's the edema in the muscle because of the sodium coming in with water. The neutrophils, you can see it here, coming in in the heart attack within the first several days. And then who follows neutrophils are the macrophages. These are the shepherds of tissue repair. These are the ones that will shepherd the process of taking that necrotic heart muscle and replace it with scar tissue or collagen and it takes up to six weeks. And here are the macrophages coming in over here. So let's go through this table grossly. So here I said the, there's three places where the heart muscle is vulnerable to damage. One is the subendocardium, as you can see here, because where are the coronary arteries? On the surface of your heart. So those branches arborize. So this is called a subendocardial infarct because it's less than 50% of the wall thickness. When the infarcted area is greater than 50% of the wall thickness, it's transmural, okay? And you'll see the consequences in a moment what happens. Where are the other two places the heart gets oxygen, the last place to get oxygen is the tip of your heart called the apex. Because remember, where are the blood vessels coming off? At the base of the heart. So by the time it gets to this, this is the last place to get oxygen. The other structure in the heart that is the last place to get oxygen that's vulnerable to a heart attack is your papillary muscles attached to your mitral valve. And I'll show you what happens when you get a heart attack there. 
So those are the three places, the subendocardium, the apex, and the papillary muscles, because they're dependent upon the coronary arteries. Yes? So how did, did they take a biopsy? How did they tell this from a, a person that's still living that's had a heart attack? Right, so what do they do is they're going to do EKG changes. On the EKG, because they have 12 leads, and because of the electrical changes, they can know what part of the heart is being affected. Anterior septum, posterior septum, the left ventricle versus the right ventricle. Then they can also do an echocardiogram to look at blood flow. And now, if the muscle wall is dead, what's going to happen to its contractility? Goes down, so you will see hypokinesis. It's not moving. And you correlate all this information with what's going on with the patient. Okay? Now, what does it look like? The earliest time you can see a heart attack in the myocardium is at 24 hours because you have all these cellular changes. And if you look at this, here's the apex of the heart. And here are the sections that are going toward the base. You can see they get bigger and bigger. So what ventricle is this? How do you know? Thicker wall. Very good. See? Anatomy. Works. So this must be the right ventricle. Now, the normal myocardium is red-brown, but what do you notice about the myocardium on the subendocardium? What do you notice about its color? It's pale. This is a subendocardial infarct. But it, where do you notice to see the worst is it where? At the apex, because it's the last place to get oxygen. So it's all dead. And so this is a patient who had a subendocardial infarct involving the septum and the free wall of the left ventricle. So what arteries were involved? All is coronary arteries. Okay? And there is the dead heart muscle that's sub intercardio. Now this is a heart preparation to demonstrate, here are the coronary arteries. This is two branches, this is the left, this is the right. You can see the lumen in cross section gets narrow, narrow because this patient has severe atherosclerosis. And the, these white arrows represent complete thrombosis. Now we look at the corresponding heart. Which ventricle is this? Right. The right, and this is? Right. See, you can become pathologists. That's the first start. Here's the normal myocardium. What do you notice about the color over here? Pale. It's pale, but it involves the full thickness of the wall. Now we call it what type of infarct? Transmural, because it's greater than 50% of the wall thickness. Very good. Ah. What part of the heart we're looking here is the left ventricle. What is this muscle called? The papillary muscle. These are what are called the corda tendini. They attach to your tricuspid valve, attaches to your, the corda tendini with those papillary muscles, and then the mitral valve is attached to, by the, the papillary muscles by these corda tendini. Now, why are they there? When you think of the blood coming from the atria, whether it's the right or the left, those valves have to close. When you contract, they make sure they don't go backwards up into the chamber. So what has to hold them in place is the corda tendini, and when the papillary muscles contract, they pull on the cords to make them taunt, so blood cannot go backwards into the atria. But now what would happen if the muscle dies? What's going to happen to blood flow? It goes backwards, and now the heart's ability to pump out blood is a problem. And what you're seeing here is hemorrhage or a heart attack of the papillary muscle. This is the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, and right above it is the aorta. And that's the normal anatomy in your heart as well, as well as mine. And so, where are the three places are vulnerable to ischemic damage? Is the subendocardium, the apex or the tip of the heart, and then the papillary muscles. So, what are the complications? When will the heart muscle rupture? Remember, the heart is still beating, and you have dead muscle. So what can happen is, it's under pressure. What happens to the compliance? Dead tissue is more compliant or less compliant? It is more compliant. It is mushy. I can poke a hole right through it. So now if the heart is beating and it has pressure in those chambers, it can tear right through the muscle wall. Now it's going to be a problem. Let's see what happens here. It occurs in the first two weeks when you have the heart attack. I always tell this to students. 
here at UCSF or anywhere in the world, if you want to study in a very quiet place, is not the library. It's in the cardiac care unit. Why in the cardiac care unit where they have a heart attack? Because there's no cell phones allowed. There's no children under the age of 14 allowed. <laughs> there's no political discussions about gun control or anything else, abortion, whatever. Because what happens to your blood pressure when you get into these moments of crying children or cell phones going off? And now you've just had a heart attack. What would that do to your heart? It could cause rupture. Now patients, what they'll do is, there's stories where they feel great for three days because they have no family, no cell phones, no work bothering them. They feel, oh, man, I'm going to go out and do some exercise. So I'm going to get on the floor and do some push-ups. Uh-uh-uh-uh. Then they have their heart rupture because what's going to happen to your blood pressure when you do push-ups? So when do you think they tell them to do, they can do push-ups? What time? Six weeks under the doctor's supervision. There's a reason for this. So it's maximal because you have dead heart muscle and plus those inflammatory cells are trying to break it down so it makes it more compliant so it can rupture. And it occurs in about five to eight percent of infarcts. Now where does it occur? It occurs if there's a transmural infarct, it ruptures, I'll show you an example of this in a moment. You can see that the septum tears away from the apex or your papillary muscle just tears away. It ruptures. So what does this look like? This is an autopsy, obviously, of a heart. We're looking at the epicardium. And you can see a laceration or tearing of the tissue, a crack through it. Here we're seeing the normal myocardium, red-brown. This is the left ventricle. Here is the rupture. You can see it is gone right through the wall, like somebody just tore it apart. And this is dead heart muscle. What type of infarct is this? Subendocardial or transmural? Transmural because it's greater than 50% of the wall thickness. Now, what happens if your ventricular chamber ruptures? It looks like this. To give you orientation, this is the pericardial sac around the heart. This right here is the epicardium of the heart. This green arrow shows you a rupture through the left ventricular wall. This right arrow is showing the circumflex arrow that has no lumen, it has 100% occlusion, and had a transmural infarct, and we see about anywhere between six to 800 mLs of blood. Now it fills up your pericardial sac. What's gonna happen to that wall? Because remember from physics, liquids, are they compressible or non-compressible? Non-compressible. So what's gonna happen to that heart? It can't fill blood, and now you can't pump out the blood, and the patient dies as a consequence. So this is what is called cardiac tamponade. In this case, that's where that term comes from. You're tamponading the heart because of the fluid, in this case, blood, compressing on the heart, okay? Ah, what structure is ruptured? There is the two papillary muscles. The papillary muscle should be attached to one another. It ripped apart. And so now the mitral valve can't function, okay? What are the complications? If it doesn't rupture, because the wall is it being remodeled, it can dilate out. We call that an aneurysm. You get what is called a ventricular aneurysm, and it occurs up to one-third of all heart attacks, depending upon the damage to it. And what does this look like? Now this orientation, I've got to give you a little orientation here. When the heart is formed, it's formed on your embryonic plate as a tube in front of your brain. You don't realize that your heart is in front of your, it's the most anterior part. When you form your body cavities, the heart folds underneath your brain. That's why it ends up in the chest. And what, think of my fingers, it's a tube that basically the bottom finger is the outflow, tra the inflow track, the inferior vena cava, superior vena cava, and the pulmonary veins. The outflow track is the pulmonary artery and aorta. What is called the truncus arteriosus. Truncus, like a tree, the trunk. It separates the two circulations from the pulmonary artery from your aorta, embryologically. So what we're looking at here, that's the aorta. That's the aortic valve, because I can see the coronary, uh, sept, uh, coronary ostia. So the, aortic the aorta is posterior to the pul pulmonary artery that's right here, and this is the pulmonary valve. So this is the right ventricle here, and here is the aorta. So what's below here 
is the left ventricle, but what do you notice about the wall? It's very thin compared to the normal wall, and this is an aneurysm. It dil dilates out. What can form in there is a thrombus, and they can break off and travel to your brain or to other organs or occlude the opening. And so that's a ventricular aneurysm. Another thing that can happen is a mural thrombus. If the heart muscle is dead, what happens to ability to contract? It's decreased, so therefore what can accumulate a, on the surface of the heart is a thrombus. And that thrombus is a reflection of this dead muscle and the hypokinesis or decreased motion. So this then occurs about 6%. What does this look like? If it's on the right side, it can go to your lungs. On the left side, it can go to systemically to other organs like your brain and kidney. This is what it looks like. This is a heart that's been opened up at autopsy. Here we're seeing the mitral valve. Right above it is the left atrium. Here is the trabecular carni muscle and the papillary muscles. And then you see this big red mass against the wall. And this whole thing is the mural thrombus because you can't see the muscle here. The muscle is covered up by this thrombus. See, I'm a very visual person. That's why I like pathology. I like to see it. Once you see it, you realize what can happen. And you want to prevent it. Okay? And that's the left atrium and the trabecular carotid muscle. Now we're looking at the posterior wall of the left ventricle. And we notice it's pale infarct. What type of infarct is this? It's greater than 50% of the wall sickness. This is a transmural infarct. And here you can see at the edge is what we call granulation tissue. This is where the macrophages and blood vessels are coming in. This is a fixed specimen. It'd be a red border around the edge. And then eventually all this necrotic muscle is going to be converted into scar tissue. And that'll take up to six weeks. There is the myocardium, red-brown, and then the infarct. This is what it looks like at two weeks at the edge of the infarct. The neutrophils are gone. Now you have new blood vessels, fibroblasts laying down the collagen that's now going to take this dead heart muscle, you don't see no nuclei, and replace it with scar tissue. And that'll be at about six weeks. And this is what it looks like at six weeks. What do you, what's the color of scar tissue? What do you see there? It's white. If you look at your own scars, what color are they usually? White. And the collagen that gets eventually remodeled into that scar is collagen type 1. That represents 90% of type 1. What do you notice about the wall thickness here compared to the normal wall here? Thinner, because what does all scar tissue do? Contracts. It's the most powerful mechanical force in the human body. What do you think is going to happen to the ability of this heart to pump in this area? it's not there anymore. And the person has to live with this for the rest of their life. Okay? Once you get the scar, it's irreversible. So that's ischemic heart disease. Any questions about that? Okay? Rheumatic heart disease. This is an acute recurrent inflammatory disease process. And it, you have a pharyngeal infection. How many people have had a strep throat? Right? And no problems, right? But there's a certain strep organism called Streptococcus group A that has unique propensity in certain individuals to cause an immunologic response to it that's going to destroy the heart. How many people have heard of the condition called acute rheumatic heart disease or acute rheumatic fever? Yeah. It usually occurs at what age? In adolescence. Because the immune system is now being exposed as teenagers to the world throughout your life since birth. But when you get this type of particular organism in genetically susceptible hosts, they'll create this disease in the heart. What does rheum mean? Does anybody know what rheum mean? Because why do they call it rheumatic? What does rheum mean? It means joint. When you have rheumatism, it means they got stiffness in the joints. So rheum, so the study of rheumatology is disease that involve the joints since the whole area, okay? So it typically occurs in adolescence and you have recurrent injury can lead to chronic damage to the valves and become fibrotic. The most common valve is the mitral valve and becomes fibrotic. So here's the pathogenesis. 
you have a strep throat, group A. Your genetics is susceptible. Here you have the streptococcal, uh, streptococcal organisms that go to your lymph nodes in your neck where it drains your oral cavity. Then you're going to make antibodies against this organism and you clear the infection. You're happy, right? Except what happens is these antibodies to the streptococcal antigens now react to the same molecules in the heart and now causes damage to the epicardium, the myocardium, and to your valves. And you form these, this damage along the edges of the valve leaflets and causes damage to the myocardium and the pericardium, leading to a pericarditis or inflammation. So what happens is you get these what are called Ashkoff bodies, so you get this fibrinoid necrosis because of the immunologic damage that's occurring, lymphocytes and macrophages, and it affects all three layers of the heart, the epicardium, myocardium, and endocardium, and it also now causes joint arthritis acutely. That's where the term comes from when it was first described in people who had this infection, and it affects the knees. Why the knees? No one knows. Then it can also affect the blood vessels because it's part of the cardiovascular system. In the skin, you get these subcutaneous nodules and it's red around the edge of these nodules, erythema, marginatum. And then it can also cause vasculitis in various organs like your brain. This is what it looks like in the heart. You get these vegetations along the lines of closure. Remember the normal thickness of a heart valve is a sheet of paper and basically these are the vegetations that will be repaired and it becomes thickened as a function of time. And here are the corda tendinae, nice and thin connective tissue attached to your mitral valve. And these are the vegetations. Then microscopically, this is the endocardium. You see there's inflammatory cells, necrotic endocardium. These are called the Ashkoff bodies. And here are two Ashkoff bodies destroying the myocardium. People can actually die of acute rheumatic fever because it damages the heart and you go into congestive heart failure. And then chronically, it can make the valves thicker, like basically cardboard, and so you get stenosis. So it prevents blood from going from the left atrium to the left ventricle, and the blood backs up. I have a specimen here that illustrates this. This came from an 84-year-old man. That is the, what I'm opening up is the left atrium. See this dilated chamber? And then if you look at the heart valve, this is how thick it, when you come up here, you can see it looks like greater than cardboard. It is non-compliant. So the valve became so thick and it prevented blood from going to the left ventricle. Look at the left ventricle. That's the size of his left ventricle where my thumb is. And this is the size of his left atrium because the valve is so non-compliant because of the fibrosis and damage to it. Normally patients get an artificial or prosthetic heart valve that replaces this. But this patient lived to 84. Not bad. And I'll show you what it looks like micro grossly in a minute. So it becomes fibrotic and scarred down and scar tissue contracts and le less compliant. Short and thick and infused corda tendinae, so it's going to be very rigid, so it's less compliant. And what happens to the left atrium? The blood backs up pressure, it dilates because it doesn't have a lot of tissue in the wall. And then what could form in there? Stasis of blood, a thrombus. And then what likes to live on damaged valves is bacteria that get in the bloodstream. So you get a, a disease called infective endocarditis and that can, the mortality rate with therapy is 35 to 50 percent mortality. And it costs about a quarter of a million to three quarters of a million dollars to treat patients with infective endocarditis. So it's not a cheap disease. This is what it looks like. You can see the mitral valve leaflet. Normally the valves are avascular. When you see blood vessels in the valve, it means it's been damaged. It's part of the tissue repair. You see the white scar tissue, and you see the corda tendinae are thickened and fused. And then here's a real uh, mitral valve. You can see how thickened and the corda tendinae. What's going to happen to the lungs? If it backs up in the left atrium, is it going to back up in the lungs? Well, it's going to back up and you increase hydrostatic pressure. You get edema and congestion, so the patient will be complaining of shortness of breath. You get hemorrhage into the alveolar sacs, and the heart, the lung tissue can infarct. I'll show you what a lung looks like in a minute. The blood will be 
picked up by macrophages in your alveolar sacs and it's basically brown sputum if you cough it up because of the macrophages taking up the blood. Then the arterioles, arteries will become thickened, then they'll become fibrotic and what happens to the right ventricle? It sees greater pressure, it gets enlarged and then your heart, your right heart fails as a consequence of this. This is what a lung looks like. What's the normal lung? If I were to take out your lung and look at it, or you look at it, it's pink, like that sweater. Anybody wearing pink? That's your favorite color because that's the color of your lungs, is pink. But here it looks beefy red, and it's beefy red because all that blood, because it can't get to the left ventricle because it's backing up into the lungs and causing damage. And so if the, if the valve is thickened and it can't close, you can also, when it get, instead of stenosis, it goes backwards. We call that term insufficiency or regurgitation. It's going backwards instead of going uh, forward when the valve is abnormal. The aortic valve can also be involved. It can be stenotic or blood can come back through diastolic pressure in the aorta back into the left ventricle. This is what an aortic valve looks like. You can see here that it is damaged and that area is where the blood has to get out of the heart. So what's going to happen to the left ventricle? It becomes hypertrophied, just like in hypertension, okay? The last thing is congestive heart failure. We've seen three conditions, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, and rheumatic heart disease. If the heart is damaged, then you, it can lead to what is basically, you have signs and symptoms of when the heart is failing, where it can't meet the metabolic needs of the body, okay? There, what are the causes? We talked about three tonight that involve the heart, so we call these intrinsic heart diseases, can lead to congestive heart failure. There are other conditions that can lead to heart failure that has nothing to do with the heart. And what do you think that might be? Remember, what's the molecule that's critical to cells in eukaryotic cells is oxygen. So what delivers oxygen is red blood cells. It binds the hemoglobin, so if you have anemia, anemia means decreased red blood cell mass, and there are many causes for having decreased red blood cells, and so if the red blood cells are decreased in your intravascular volume, what is the heart gonna do? Do you think in somebody who has severe anemia? Will it beat faster or slower? Faster. So what if you were beating all the time? What's gonna happen to that heart? It can fail and lead to congestive heart failure. That is called non-cardiac. Now, there are different names for this. High output is in where you're pumping the blood really quickly in response like to anemia. Low output failure means the heart is damaged, like a heart attack, rheumatic heart disease. It's also called forward and backward, same term, but what we use is left-sided and right-sided. Now, can anybody in this room figure out which is left or right? Well, you can look at the patient. All you have to do is walk into the examining room and look at the patient. So let's look at left-sided. If the patient had left-sided heart failure, the left ventricle, what do you think the patient would be complaining about? Would they be happy or would they be really anxious? What do you think? Well, look at this gentleman. Does he look happy? What do you notice about him? How many people have been in a swimming pool where you walk out to the deep end and what do you end up doing? You walk like this because you don't want to swallow any water. What do you notice he's using the, the chair for? He's arching his back so he can get all the fluid. This is left-sided heart failure because it's backing up into his lungs. The hydrostatic pressure increases, you get edema, he's drowning in his own fluid. And when you ask them, what do you do at night when you sleep? What do you think they're gonna tell you? they're gonna be sitting up in bed and you can ask them how many pillows do you use to go to sleep with? And these are the questions that's a reflection that it's telling you it's the left side of the heart that's failing, okay? Now what if the right side of the heart failed? What would be the demeanor of this patient? It would be like this woman, just sitting there, waiting for you. But you notice she's not moving. Obviously it's a picture, she can't move anyway. But what do you notice that she's not wearing? Besides the clothes. <laughs> this is the examining room. 
She's not wearing any shoes because they don't fit anymore because now if the right side fails, what happens to all the blood? It causes the venous system to increase hydrostatic pressure. Now what do you notice about the size of her legs? She's got now anasarca. Remember we talked about that? She's got fluid throughout her entire body. Her belly, that's not because, not because somebody's big doesn't mean you're fat. There are other reasons for big bodies, and it means more fluid. And because what's this outline is her liver, because the blood is backing up, and it's causing the liver to become bigger. Can you fill your liver right now? Yes, you can. Tonight, while you're thinking about your finals tomorrow, if you've got finals, while you're laying there contemplating your fate, in the bed, put your fingers right down your right costal margin. And then take a deep breath, and you'll feel your liver push your fingers out of the way. You're feeling the anterior portion of the right lobe of the liver. That's why the physician puts their hand right there. So you can feel your liver anytime during the exam or at night. <laughs> so you can feel your liver. And her liver is enlarged, so you'd find her liver all the way down here. Because it's all the edema and congestion. So this is right side of her failure. Can you have both at the same time? Yes. And it, so it's not just on exams where it's one side or the other. So what have we done? What are the four variables that we think of the cardiovascular system? Pressure. Pressure. Those are the four variables. So the next time you think of pathology, you think of how you look at it. My daughter took this photograph and she wanted something to remember. And I like pink lemonade. <laughs> on that note, have a great holidays. Good luck on your exams. Thank you very much.